So the first several studies that were shared in the research were all about the cognitive effects of vibration and perturbation training, because the better that we get physically, the better oftentimes we feel emotionally as well and the safer we feel. And that feeling of confidence is vital in improving our walking and reducing our falls for the long haul. I'm Garrett Saulpeter, and I believe that the most powerful and transformative way to help people recover from pain and injury, heal from trauma, and reach their highest levels of fitness and performance is to focus on the nervous system. In this podcast, we'll share knowledge from the frontiers of neuroscience and inspirational stories of how applying that knowledge has empowered people from all walks of life to heal, adapt, and grow. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the New Fit Undercurrent podcast. We are joined today for the second time by Dr. Gretchen Hawley, who you may know as the host of the Missing Link podcast and the writer and curator of the Missing Link website and program. And she is a wealth of knowledge on the topic of MS and helping patients navigate the MS disease and work to restore function. And it's been fun to connect the dots on several of the patients that we've shared, you know, that have been working with her and also using the newbie. And she's very graciously had me on her podcast a couple of times. She was on, if you haven't heard it yet, I would encourage you to go back and listen to episode 40 on our podcast when she was on. And we talked more generally about the differences in treating orthopedic and neurological patients about neuroplasticity and about some of her very valuable frameworks for how to treat and help MS patients. So a very good episode. We'll sort of pick up where we left off there. So if you if you would like to go back and listen, I encourage you to do so. And today she's joining us to share some research updates. So it's been almost exactly two years since she was last on the podcast. So she's joining us to share some updates in her work and on research in the field and help us all get up to date on things that that you know clinicians can use in working with patients and also that if any individual patients are listening that uh, perhaps they might be able to use on their own or complementing the newbie or different things here so I'm excited to dive in and Gretchen welcome Thanks so much for having me I'm always excited to share updates cuz I feel like the way that I treat is very evidence-based. And so anytime there's updates, I love for everyone to know them because it is usually something that you can implement on your own as well. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive in. Awesome. Yes. I'm always uh, excited to to learn more. I, I was at a, a conference last weekend and someone said something really good. He said, uh, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be in a room where everybody's getting smarter. Ooh, that was a I good, like that. Good quote. So Hopefully, uh, the collective room that we're sitting in, all you know, doing this, this having this conversation together, we're all going to be getting smarter here. So, update wise, I know we talked a little bit. I haven't heard all of these details, so I'm even excited to to follow along and listen to. But I know uh, one that you that you you know intend to share is related to vibration. So, uh, can you can you uh, dive in and start there? Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that a lot of my clients are working towards, and I think your clients might be as well, or at least those interested in newbie and new fit, is reducing tripping and reducing falls. And that can be extremely powerful because it will not only mean that you're likely improving strength and balance, but it also improves your confidence and it affects you psychologically as well. And so at this conference, a big topic was reducing falls and improving that through vibration training and therapy. And it was really interesting because the very first few trainings were all about the effect that falls and vibration training actually have psychologically. And so they were showing tons of research on how improving your balance and reducing falls through vibration and perturbation training affects us psychologically. And I just thought that was really cool because so often we assume that training our muscles will improve us physically, but we so forget. Just to, uh, just to, uh, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, okay. wanna, I, want, I want to keep that, keep that train of thought. But if people are wondering here, when you're talking about vibration, are we talking about like like a vibration platform or, or a, you know, when you say perturbations, like one of these 
treadmills that I've seen in motor control labs that oscillate side to side and what, what, what it just, just so everyone can kind of visualize what you're talking about as we go here. Can you just share a little bit about like what exactly that, that means? Yeah. So vibration therapy or vibration training can be done at home or in a clinic. And typically it's done with you having your feet sitting or standing on a vibration plate. And there's a few different options. They have ones that go back and forth or side to side or up and down, but you are, you have your feet on a plate that vibrates. And again, you can be sitting or standing. Whereas perturbation training can either be, as you just mentioned, you're on a treadmill or one of these motor machines that will make you fall off balance that require you to have a stepping strategy. So it purposely puts you in these safe positions to lose your balance and make sure you're training your body to recover when you lose your balance in real life situations. But that also can be done in person, as long as you can do this safely, you could have someone just tapping you from one side to the other. But the whole point of perturbation training is putting you in a position that makes you have a stepping response. So you'd have to step to help recover. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. So now we're on the same page. So then, then you were, you were saying, you're talking about some of the, the, you know, the psychological effects of falling and things like that. So we can get, get back, get back on that, on that train there. Yeah. Yeah. So the research was showing that about 70% of people with MS will have falls. And, and one thing I also should clarify is falls are not always heavy falls to the ground that end in injury. Sometimes that's what we think of when we think of a fall, but a fall is any time you ended up on the ground unintentionally even if it was controlled. And so many people don't consider that a fall. And if we don't consider that a fall, then we're missing out on a whole area of training that could really improve safety and balance when moving. So the first several studies that were shared in the research were all about the cognitive effects of vibration and perturbation training, because the better that we get physically, the better oftentimes we feel emotionally as well and the safer we feel. And that feeling of confidence is vital in improving our walking and reducing our falls for the long haul. Because even if we do improve our balance through vibration or perturbation training, if we are still fearful of falling or not confident that we can walk without falling, it won't have as big of an impact. So there was just a big focus on focusing on the psychological and the physical components and how they relate. Awesome. I think that's, that's great information. And the, are there any, any of your, you know, could you have this, the missing link program? So I mentioned that the, the intro, I didn't say it's MS ing. So it's, you know, play on a, a wonderful, clever bit of wordplay, which I very much appreciate. Puns are my favorite form of humor. So uh, just sort of, if people you know haven't seen the website or something, it's missing M-S-I-N-G link.com, right? Is the website. Yep. Um, so, so you now through that website, you're working with people even more remotely than in person. I know obviously you are a physical therapist, have worked with people in person, but working remotely. So are you recommending certain uh, vibration products to people, or can you talk a little bit about what what you might what uh, specific recommendations there might be in that category? Yeah, absolutely. So we mentioned both vibration and perturbation training. However, because I mostly work with clients virtually now, I do every now and then work with some clients in person. So if I'm working in person, that might be a little bit different because we could do perturbation training safely. But I would never recommend that someone at home that I'm not able to witness and make sure they're staying safe, that they have their spouse just pushing them in one direction or another to force them to take a step. That's probably not going to be the safest. So in The Missing Link and with all of my virtual clients, what we tend to focus on is more of the vibration training. And one thing that was shared that I thought was really interesting was that the best version. They didn't give any specific brands of what product would be best, but what you really want to be looking for 
is a vibration plate that goes up and down versus side to side or rotation or forward backwards. They mentioned that those can be helpful, but the ones in research that specifically showed a benefit that was statistically significant in reducing falls were the vibration plates that went up and down. And the reason for that was because they were going up and down against gravity, whereas all of the other positions and vibrations didn't affect gravity. They were all on the same plane. So typically now in the missing link, when someone asks, you know, what, what brand should I get? I don't give a specific brand, but I do say, look for the ones that go up and down. And some, some vibration plates offer lots of different types of vibration. It's not just one or the other, but you'd want to for sure be working with one on the setting where it goes up and down instead of side to side or rotation. Okay. So that's good that you mentioned up and down too, because also before we move on from this topic, I wanted to to spend a moment talking about the mechanism here. This is something that I've I've looked at a little bit off and on during the years, at not using vibration on a regular basis. I, I certainly wouldn't call myself an expert, but um, you know, I think we can at least talk about it for for a little bit here. So so if someone's standing on a platform, the surface is actually moving up and down. So it's sort of like they're doing mini jumps and landing or landings. It's like they're landing from, you know, a, a half an inch, half an inch, half an inch, and they could do it, you know, 10, 40 or something times, a, you know, a second, depending on the frequency of vibration. And so I've heard that described a few ways. One being that it creates these vibrations that help pump lymph because you get the mechanical pumping. I've heard it described as, you know, creating, since you're, since you're getting these miniature, essentially landings, as if you were falling off a, a half inch surface or whatever the ampl amplitude is, you know, each those, those all those times per second, you're getting a little bit of vertical axial loading. So there could I've heard I've heard of you know people talk about bone density benefits. We've got lymph bone density, but ultimately, especially given our your area of interest and mine being the nervous system, we want to talk about how it causes the reflexive neurological activation. So like you talk about perturbations in the stepping response. Is the, is the mechanism of action and is the benefit essentially that it's causing the nervous system to have to react all those, all those times per second to the, to the change in force and get that reflexive firing happening faster? Yeah. And not only that, but it makes your muscles activate too. So it might not feel like it in the moment when you're using it, but just the fact that it's going up and down, it's making your neural pathways activate and it's making specific muscles activate. And those specific ones that are responsible for reducing that risk of falls. So things like the muscles on the front of your ankle, the tibialis anterior, the muscles on the back of your ankle, which would be the calf muscles, the outside, which are the peroneal. So it activates a lot of different muscles with the goal of strengthening them to reduce falls. And of course, your neural pathways have to be activated first. So vibration training is a way to get both done. And it was also mentioned that the method that you would use for vibration training specifically was that you would use it for, I believe it was three times a week for six weeks. And you would do about five rounds where each round is one minute, five, or sorry, you do five repetitions for a one bout of training, which was basically as long as you could handle, followed by one minute rest. So initially the first bout was about one minute and then the next week or maybe three or four weeks later, it was still about one minute. And then once you were closer towards the end of the six weeks, you might re increase it to about a minute and a half. So it's really slow increments. It's not like the first time you do it, you'll use it for 20 minutes. <laughs> it would be one minute for several weeks and then maybe a minute and a half for several more weeks and then maybe two minutes. And so you slowly work your way up. And after each bout, you have at least one full minute of rest before going at it again. Okay. So that, that all makes sense. Uh, one also, one thing that's worth mentioning is, you know, of course, in our all these different mechanoreceptors that we have, these sensory afferent pathways, there are pathways, you know, there's force, you know, and you mentioned the muscles are working. There's also pathways for vibration and uh, getting more 
sensory feedback, you know, as we've seen by using the Nubia and many other conversations we've had on here, you know, can be helpful. And I do know a few clinics around the country that have combined have had the Nubia on while people are standing on a vibrating vibration platform uh, or being on the vibration platform and doing squats or lunges or, or different movements or push-ups with their hands on the platform, different things like that too. So I think there's, you know, a way where things can, can combine. Um, the, um, let's see, audio issue here. Um, sorry, we had a slight um, issue with the connection freezing there. So uh, we're just chatting about the vibration and ways that people have combined this. At least a few clinics have combined vibration with the newbie. I don't have a lot of personal experience with it, but it, it sounds promising. So I'm glad that we were able to talk about that. And thank you, Gretchen, for sharing that. And then, you know, in terms of these research updates, um, I believe the next one you want to talk about was um, a few findings related to spasticity. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Spasticity, which is basically an intense form of muscle tightness that doesn't often release with just stretching alone is a big symptom in multiple sclerosis, as well as some other neurological conditions. And it can be super frustrating because the higher the level of spasticity, the harder it is to move. So if you've ever been walking and you feel like you can't bend your knee, not because it's weak, but because it feels restricted, that's likely spasticity. Or sometimes it feels like heaviness. So if you've ever felt or said, when I walk, it feels like I have a 50 pound weight attached to my right leg or my left leg, that heaviness that can also be spasticity. And for a while, what researchers were showing were best practices to reduce spasticity and other forms of muscle tightness as well was stretching or other forms of muscle release. So that might mean stretching as you and I know it, where it's 20 to 30 seconds, or pr more prolonged stretching, where it's maybe three to five minutes, or it could be muscle rolling with a foam roller or a tennis ball, massage, you know, different muscle release techniques like those. But the focus at this conference and the research updates that I got was that stretching is still important. And they did actually recommend that stretching should be done at least two to three times per day. And I always like to go on the conservative side. So what I've been recommending is the three times per day for sure, and 20 to 60 second holds. So again, I've been recommending more of the 45 to 60 seconds, but research was showing the 20 to 60 seconds which is interesting because a few years ago, they were showing that prolonged stretching, like the three to five minutes might be better. So this is kind of a, a little switch in what type of stretching is best for spasticity. But not only that, there was a heavy focus on talking about strength training to reduce spasticity and aerobic training to reduce spasticity. So with the strength training, we wouldn't want to strengthen the muscles that are spastic. We'd want to strengthen the opposing muscles. So if you had spasticity and tightness in your hamstrings, which for those that need a reminder, are the muscles on the back of your thigh, we would want to strengthen the quad muscles, which are the muscles on the front of your thigh. Or if you had spasticity in your calf, we'd want to strengthen the muscles on the front of the lower leg or vice versa. And so determining exactly where the spasticity is and still focusing on stretching that area, but strengthening the opposite side can be mutually beneficial. And I think the newbie is great for that. I, I have a decent amount of clients that I work with who are using the newbie and they're using it in that way, whether they realize it or not. As I'm talking to them, we realize where their spasticity is. And then they tell me what exercises they're doing with a newbie. And we realize, oh, that's perfect because your spasticity is in the opposing muscle. So when we're looking for strength training, that's really what we're trying to pinpoint on. And then aerobic exercise has also been shown to improve spasticity, which I, I love that this research came out because so often when people have spasticity, it feels like you can't do aerobic exercise, like you can't 
move fast enough to get your heart rate going, but there's so many different ways that you can do aerobic exercise, which we'll also get into. But the point of reducing spasticity was doing movements with full range of motion, with whatever that range of motion is. So if you had spasticity in your leg, it might mean squatting up and down fully, fully standing up, fully going down versus just these mid-level squats. So getting your heart rate up with full range of motion. So, so a couple a couple things I want to talk about. I'm going back to applications, applications of the newbie in a moment, but for aerobic there, you're talking more about like calisthenic type movements, what I would describe it. So we're talking like doing bodyweight squats. We're not talking like, you know, stationary bike or something like that, but more like more calisthenic type movements through the full range of motion. Right. Yeah. The, the research that they presented were more of the calisthenic type movements. I do imagine you could do something like a bike as long as the focus was the full range of motion in the knee and ankle. So, cause sometimes when people ride a bike, we have a little bit of a knee bend that whole time, but this would really be the focus of fully extending and then fully bending and just a, that full arc of motion, which mm-hmm. can be hard to do on a bike because the bike pedal is at a specific, or the bike seat rather is at a specific height that will allow you to maybe extend more but that might not allow you to bend more, which I think is why they focused more on the calisthenic type movements. So just to, just to kind of clarify here and I I mean, not to, not to split hairs, but when we're talking about aerobic, I I was envisioning more, you know, steady state here. When we're talking about this, I would imagine many of the MS, you know, patients that, that, you know, you and our team have worked with, you know, would likely fatigue, uh, shoot, anyone would fatigue after enough bodyweight squats. So is this more, is this more of an anaerobic interval type training than at least a little different than what I would think of when I hear the term aerobics, thinking more like longer steady state? Is it is it more that type of, uh, you know, you do different intervals or, or how is it kind of organized? Yeah, definitely more intervals. I think when most people okay. hear, I'm glad you asked that question because when most people hear aerobic, they think running on a treadmill or going for a run outside or even walking on a treadmill. But when we were talking about aerobic exercise for spasticity and even just aerobic exercise in general, it's more intermittent training. So it's more about getting your heart rate up, whatever that means for you. There's no guidelines yet as to how high your heart rate should be, like a specific number or percentage. And there's no guidelines yet for how many minutes you should be maintaining that for before resting. So usually what I suggest is to do any type of movement in full range of motion that gets your heart rate up, once you can feel it and once you feel like if we were talking, your breath might be getting a little bit more shallow and you might be struggling to have a conversation, which might be 30 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half, et cetera, then you can stop and rest and then get back into it. So it's kind of more like high intensity interval training aerobic rather than just sustained aerobic. Mm -hmm. So for, for people listening who uh, are in a clinic where they have the newbie and they might be working with MS patients, I think we've got two, two things that are research supported that make a lot of sense that you might already be doing or may choose to start doing with the newbie, but stimulating the antagonist musculature and then having patients do these more full range of motions. And if we do them with the newbie on, I mean, being able to move through a full range of motion is wonderful. I think that's a big part for all of us, you know, whether, whether we have a neurodegenerative condition or not moving, you know, th- our body, moving our joints through their full range of motion, using our muscles at shorter and longer lengths is a vital part of maintaining and improving our neuromuscular system. Right. And all that. So, so that, I mean, I think is, is congruent with a lot of, you know, what, what you and I both talk about and, and share with people. So, um, so that's good. And then I think, you know, the newbie in that case would essentially be an amplifier. If you're going to get some amount of input from doing 30 seconds worth of bodyweight squats, if you have the newbie on during that time, you're going to be getting, especially in the areas where those pads are, you're going to be getting that amount plus, plus more, more input, which can help accelerate that neuroplastic adaptation and, and help it happen either more significantly or faster or both. So I think that's good. And then, you know, in terms of stimulating antagonist muscles, um, I'm glad to hear that you mentioned some of, some of our mutual clients or actually have that in their programs already. I think that's, you know, likely by design. Shout out to Mandy, who uh, is our MS specialist and writes some programs for people, but uh, also 
people who are using it, you know, at various clinics around the country there. Um, in terms of spasticity, I do want to want to ask a little bit about effect size and, um, you know, the, the rate at which people can make progress and some of that there, and in part because back uh, just a few episodes prior to this, in episode 65, we had a physical therapist named Courtney Ellerbush on, and she was the lead investigator in the, the study that was just published. It was a case series, so seven patients using the Nubian was looking at essentially these different markers of functional recovery. And you know, many of them were able to make improvements. And one of the measures was spasticity, looking at the Ash, uh, is it Ash, Ashworth? Ashworth, yep. Ashworth Modified scale. Ashworth scale. That's right. Thank you. So um, looking at that and you know, saw some, some improvements, uh, you know, a majority of patients improved in a majority of muscles, but not all. Um, what, what have you seen is sort of the effect size, you know, if you're, if things are going well, you know, what, what, I mean, obviously there's ranges. Some people respond faster, some respond a lot slower. What's sort of the, the average range that you see in terms of how quickly people can expect to improve with spasticity? How much do they improve within one session and then maintain or lose that between sessions or over days? What, what is that, what does that pattern sort of look like? Cause spasticity is just sort of its own animal in this, in this whole realm of recovery. It really is. Um, yeah. And I know of Courtney and that research, I haven't read through the article yet. So I'm curious to catch myself up to speed on that. Um, and I don't know what she found, but what I have found is that spasticity for sure is it's, it's its own beast. <laughs> spasticity is something that sometimes is reliant on other parts of the equation, like strength and balance. And other times it's just not reliant on any of that. And it's really intense regardless of what you do. What I have found when it comes to using these techniques that we talked about and the level of improvement and who sees improvement is that first and foremost, it starts with what level of spasticity you have. So on the modified Ashworth scale, there's a grade one through four, and there's a one plus, there's a two plus. So within the one through four, there's probably realistically about six grades, I believe. So four is the worst spasticity you can imagine. It's called rigid. And the, that level of spasticity basically implies that even the Hulk could come and try to move your limb, like bend your knee or straighten your knee or your arm. And even the Hulk wouldn't be able to get it to move because it's just that rigid. So if you're that rigid, which would be a four, or even if you're about a three, the likelihood that you would see improvements right away or even within a few months is very unlikely, I would say. It might take you a year of staying consistent with these exercises and this the combo, the stretching, the strengthening, the aerobic. But if you're on the lower to middle end, so if you're a grade one, one plus two, two plus, for all of my clients that I've worked with who are in those ranges, they do tend to see improvements, I would say within two to three months or so. And when I say two to three months, that's more of the lasting improvements. They will see improvements earlier on where after the first few sessions, they're saying, wow, I don't feel as tight. I don't feel as spastic. But by the next time I see them, they're back to feeling tight and spastic. So usually it's been around the three month mark or so where it's lasting longer. And of course, they're implementing these exercises at home as well. It's not just at physical therapy. But if you're in that lo lower to mid range, you're way more likely to see improvements with this type of training. And for me personally, it's been about three months of consistent training, again, that about the three times per day to start noticing those changes over the long haul versus just intermittently. Thank you so much for listening to the Undercurrent podcast. If you're interested in learning more about how NewFit and the Newbie can impact your life, please visit our website at www.new.fit, that's N E U. Dot FIT, so you can learn more about how it might integrate into your professional practice, how you can use it as a patient, and you can also connect with our team there. Okay, that's good information. So thank you for that. And I think that you know, for for, for you know, of course, using technology like the newbie, the goal is to accelerate that. If you can take what what yeah. might often take three months and 
make it two and a half or two months or, you know, that, that is sort of the, the goal there. And people listening who have experience with the, with the device, of course, likely are already thinking about the use of different frequencies where, for example, you can use one set of frequencies to support the, the relaxation of muscles. So you can actually put that on the muscles that are spastic. Try that, you know, sometimes, sometimes it, it causes a temporary worsening. Sometimes it, you know, sometimes it helps right away, but generally it helps at least over, over the span of multiple sessions. And then on the antagonist, like you talked about where we want strength, we can use a different set of frequencies to preferentially contract those muscles. And that's the set of frequencies that were used in, for example, the study that we actually haven't talked about yet on this podcast, but um, study that came out showing the newbie being able to, to promote high muscle hypertrophy, where you're getting more, more contraction there. So, so for people who have a device, that's sort of the line of thinking that we want to apply is, is help, you know, lengthen or inhibit or relax the, the spastic musculature and then contract more, activate more the antagonist musculature. So just, just piggybacking off of what you said earlier, Gretchen there. Um, and then that pattern I think is, is worth discussing a little bit where, where, you know, it's interesting where people, you know, we see this, I'm sure every, everyone listening who's a clinician likely, likely has seen this or patients you've experienced it, but you know, you get, you you start your session at some level at the end of the session, you get, you know, some benefit and you're like, wow, I feel, I feel better right now. And then, you know, that might last a couple hours. And by the time you wake up the next morning, you've regressed back. So the goal is you'd want to be better when you woke up that next morning than you were when you woke up the previous morning. So you're, you're, when you're comparing same, you know, the same circumstance to circumstance, you're seeing improvement. But when you're in that peak state of having just completed a session, gotten a lot of input, a lot of the proper training, it's sort of like warming up for a, for a, a, a weightlifting event or a sprinting race. Like you don't necessarily, you, I mean, the, ideally you, you want to, you don't want to have a ton of warm up time. You want to be able to, to transition in, you know, have that sort of, that sort of robust system, but you, you don't necessarily go run your fastest right away or lift your heaviest weight right away. You do that after a few sets of and kind of work into it and same sort of thing here. And, and, we're always adapting and getting better to, to what it is that we're doing or, or becoming more like the state that we're in most frequently. So the more frequently you can be in that state at the end of the session, when you're in that, that peak state of peak function of improved function, the more frequently you can do that, the more you're going to start adapting in that direction. So we want to encourage people not to, not to think that it's, you know, that it's not worthwhile or that anything is wrong if they don't maintain that and start over at the previous session exactly where they were. The goal is to check the same time points, check where you were in the morning, waking up and then going into your session when you're cold before you've done any warm up. kind of compare those milestones to just one other thing that I think is relevant. Yeah. And I think too, when we're talking specifically about spasticity, it's really important to have the same discussion of we would not want to go, go big or go home, especially not in the beginning, because with spasticity, when it lessens, sometimes what happens is whatever strength you have or don't have is then truly revealed. And for some people with MS, when you lessen spasticity, it sounds like a great thing. Like, yes, I'm finally more flexible. I'm not as t tight and spastic. But what some people say is they feel like they have jelly legs, like they, they got rid of the spasticity, but there's just no strength there to stand for t very long or to walk well. And the reason for that is because the spasticity was so tight that it was limiting your use of muscles. And so if we just get rid of all of that spasticity super fast, you're way more likely to feel off balance and unsteady because you haven't walked or moved that way in a very long time. So we, we actually want it to be more slow and gradual so that we can also work on strengthening at the same time. That way, over the long haul, you'll have reduced spasticity while also having improved strength and balance, not magically reduced spasticity, but you're feeling wobbly and all over the place. That's a good, excellent insight too. That's good. That's good. Uh, so... Anything else in terms of research updates or 
uh, anything else, you know, for our, our uh, two year catch up here? Yeah. The only thing that I wanted to also mention was a few updates on the aerobic exercise component, which we did talk about just now in relation to spasticity. But even not in relation to spasticity, over the last few years, there has been a lot of research showing that doing aerobic exercise first before neuroplasticity type exercises and training will actually prime your brain for neuroplasticity. So just simply by doing aerobic and cardio exercise first, your brain is more likely to find and strengthen those neural pathways, which is what we're shooting for with functional exercises like I do and with the newbie as well. So initially, we didn't know much. We just knew aerobic exercise first, and that's good. But now we actually do have some guidelines. We don't yet know how many minutes to be shooting for or anything like that, but we do know that we want to be shooting for about 60 to 80% of your heart rate. So initially we didn't know how high to go, but now we kind of have that guideline. We also know that the two most important factors that will play a role in aerobic exercise to promote neuroplasticity is the intensity and the speed. So this could mean for intensity, maybe you're holding more weights or you're using a resistance band, you're doing something to make the exercise more intense. And then speed is pretty self-explanatory. The faster you're moving, the more likely you'll be able to promote that aerobic exercise in a way that would promote neuroplasticity. And for those who might be thinking right now, especially if you do have MS or any other neurological or autoimmune disease, you might be thinking, well, if I do that, my legs are going to be so tired, I won't be able to then do my exercises afterwards. So you could always do seated exercises with your upper body. It doesn't have to be your lower body if you know that that's going to fatigue you, but you'd use the same guidelines. So one really easy example is I like to do seated upper body jumping jacks. So you're sitting and you're just bringing your arms up and down, up and down. And we'd want to go as fast as we can. And we'd want to make it a little bit more intense, potentially by adding weights or resistance band. So it doesn't always have to be with the legs. I just wanted to throw that out there too. But I'm really excited that we now have, excuse me, I'm excited that we now have those guidelines because for about two or three years, there were no guidelines. We just knew that it was helpful. So I thought that was exciting. That's great. And I can't help but make the connection there between some of these concepts. Um, I actually was just on a, a live event you know, a couple of months before we're recording this here with, with our mutual friend, Dr. Walls, and gave a talk on some of the benefits of exercising the body on the brain. And a lot of the inspiration for this talk came from the book uh, called Spark by Dr. John Ratey. I don't know if he's R-A-T-E-Y. I don't know if it's Rat Ratty or Ratey, how he pronounces his name even. I've just seen it on the book. But uh, he, he talks a lot about how exercise creates BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It creates these, these compounds that actually act like miracle grow fertilizer for the brain and nervous system and help grow new, whether you can grow new neurons in certain areas or at least new connections between them. Um, and also uh, different growth factors for growing the, the scaffolding like glial cells around new neurons. And also uh, I think it's VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor that helps grow new new blood vessels, microvasculature, so you can bring blood and energy to these. So, so all of these growth factors are created and secreted by the body in response to exercise. And so that sets the stage. It's like literally like putting fertilizer on nerves so they can grow faster. And he told a really cool story. Um, you know, of course, in that talk, we're talking about how it's relevant for MS, just, just like you're sharing here. But he also told a story that I, I was reminded of it when you were talking about doing this before, uh, you know, a, a rehabilitation session or before, you know, a functional training session. He talked about how there was a, a, um, uh, group of students that, that were studied, studied from going from eighth grade into ninth grade. So they're entering, entering high school and these students were behind in reading and they all were having a special literacy class, the first school period of the day. And some, you know, maybe half the kids, but I don't know what the exact percentage was, a group of the kids 
went for what they called a zero period and they did basically gym class and they were running and doing aerobic activity beforehand and then half the group didn't and they saw the group that the group that went and exercised before this literacy class they were just like a grade level or two beyond every the the group that didn't do that it made such a huge statistically significant difference it made it was just it was amazing and so it definitely speaks to this connection between brain and body you know we often or some people think of the body just as being this you know machine to carry around the brain but it's uh, you know the, the body affects the brain the brain affects the body it's a two-way street and i just could, it couldn't help but think of that example also Absolutely. And, you know, I always talk about neuroplasticity and how it affects our physical body, like our strength, our balance, our walking. But neuroplasticity affects everything. It affects the way that we think. It affects our habits that we have. It's way more than just our muscles. So, yeah, that's a, a beautiful example of other ways that priming your brain in that way can help your neural pathways, even just for learning. That's awesome. Yes, absolutely. So uh, before... Before listening to this podcast, hopefully everyone was doing some exercise. Yes. <laughs> They're able, able to take in the information. Uh, so let's see. So we've talked about um, vibration and perturbation training, spasticity, uh, and then now aerobic training and using that as, you know, essentially a warm up to help open the neuroplasticity window. Uh, any other any other topics or anything else that uh, that you'd like to share while we're doing our updates? I think those are the ones that are probably the most relevant. There there were other big topics, including sleep. And that was a really interesting one because a lot of the clients that I work with have sleep symptoms, I'll call it that. And sometimes it's related to MS, but other times it's not. And what was pointed out during the trainings was that so often when you have MS or another condition, any symptom that you have is blamed on that when in reality, it might have nothing to do with that. And so you might have sleep symptoms because your bladder maybe isn't working as it should. And so you have to get up frequently throughout the night to pee. And so that would be more of approaching, improving your sleep by going to a urologist or a pelvic floor physical therapist. But they were pointing out how common it is for sleep disturbances in MS and other conditions to actually be from sleep apnea or insomnia or restless leg syndrome, which are actual diagnoses that are treated in other ways, dissimilar to how MS is treated. So I just thought that was a really unique approach in really just reminding us like any symptom that you have might be related to the condition that you have, but it also might not be. And so it's really important to work with someone who knows that and is open to seeing all sides because in order to get treated in the best way, you have to understand the cause of it. So um, they approached that uh, with sleep as well as a few other conditions, but I just thought that was a, a refreshing take on all these things that can be symptoms of MS. Oh, yeah, that's a great, a great insight for, for patients who do have MS I mean, sleep is so important to stop the progression of the disease to, and then, you know, to help if you want to have any sort of chance to restore function, that, that adaptation happens during sleep. So it's vitally important. And to know that, you know, reduced sleep quality is not just because of MS, but could be from these other comorbid comorbidities or other things. I think that's uh, really useful information and a great perspective for, for people to take from this. So thank you. Yeah. And, you know, we could even apply that to the other things we talked about here. You know, when it comes to spasticity, when is your spasticity worse? Is it related to poor sleep? In which case, if we improve your sleep, we also might be improving your spasticity. Or is it related to fatigue or heat or cold intolerance? So if you do know of a trigger that makes one of your symptoms worse or even falls, and we were talking about vibration training, have you noticed any triggers of when your falls or tripping might be worse? Is it related to sleep or fatigue or heat intolerance or sensation changes or anything? Because ultimately, we want to be focused on the cause and these specific types of trainings that we talked about today. But if there's anything associated with it, we also need to be focused on that. Amen. I also am reminded of just two episodes ago, we had Amy Myers on, who's a, a 
a very well-known functional medicine physician. And she was talking about functional medicine being, you know, trying to get to the root cause. Of course, that's what we're doing and, you know, trying to do in the realms of physical therapy, rehabilitation. Um, so I, I, I love that you said that. It's a good reminder of that's that's got to be our kind of our North Star, really trying to figure out yeah. the root cause and work at that level. Because if you can get that first domino, then other things are, you know, get better, become irrelevant, you know, be, <laughs> whatever it might be. Um, but that's a great way to look at it. So an excellent, excellent note on which to uh, to wind down here. Gretchen, can you uh, remind everybody, please, the best best places to follow you. We already mentioned the Missing Link website, but talk about your social channels and other other platforms as well, please. Yeah, so on my website is where you can find all my services and also where to find me in other places. But I'm on Instagram as dr.gretchen. I also have a YouTube channel for anyone who likes to watch longer form videos for exercises or symptom management, walking, you name it. And my handle over there is my full name. It's Dr. Gretchen Holly. I do have my podcast called The Missing Link. And as of recent, this past July, a book called The Missing Link as well. So searching for The Missing Link with that spelling of M-S-I-N-G link, you'll find me in some way, shape or form. That's right. I know uh, we did a, a shout out on social for your book when it came out. I got, I was very fortunate. Thank you for got to read an advanced copy and I really enjoyed it. I think it's wonderful. So best place to get that is your website or Amazon or what are the, what are the best places to point people to for that? Yeah. On my website right now, I basically just direct people to Amazon. It's available in as many countries as Amazon would allow me to have it available in, which I think is 13 countries. So as whatever country you're in, you can go to Amazon and search for the missing link, or you can just search for my name and it should pop right up for you. And it will be an audio book coming in mid January or so. So I'll keep you posted with the link for that once it's available. Nice. That's a cool experience. You were in the in the studio recording all of that, right? I was, yes. That uh, we just just released ours too. And so on Instagram, it's just it's it's all spelled out. It's not dr. Gretchen. It's d o c t o r. Doctor. Gretchen. Also, yes. Just to make sure you're following the right one. Uh, <laughs> so on that note, thank you so much for coming back on the show, and you know, even more importantly, for the wonderful work that you're doing, the great information you're putting out there, the way that you're helping people that you're working with directly, and and the others that you perhaps never directly interact with, but benefit from, from your great information. And it's, you know, it's an honor to be able to collaborate with you. And I appreciate you. Thank you, Gretchen. Of course. Thank you for having me. And thank you everybody for listening to this episode of the new fit undercurrent podcast. Mm -hmm.